the last piece I just completed is actually a self, uh, an embroidered self portrait. Very realistic, it, you know, it's from a photo. It, everything is filled in perfectly and every stitch. And I had such a hard time with that. It's the piece that I've had the hardest time because I'm like, this is not me. Like, this is not my style. This is not how I work, but I did it because it was a group project. Hi, and welcome to another episode of Tom Ray's Art Podcast. I'm Tom. On today's show, I meet an artist who lives here in Madison. They originally started out wanting to learn how to be an architect, but through different series of events, paths, life happenings, they ended up working more with tactile mediums. They started creating their own papers, working with their own dyes, dyes that were connected to the heritage that they have, and creating community projects. It's a fascinating story, and there are a bunch of twists and turns, so here it is, starting right now. My name is Maria Amalia. Um, I am an artist. People here call, call me Maria. Um, I was born and raised in Honduras, and um, I've been living in the United States for more than 25 years. Oh, really? Um, mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> so sometimes my English is better. Sometimes I think in Spanish. Sometimes I dream in English. So it's back and forth, back and forth all the yeah. time. <laughs> right. Um, and then, yeah, I've been an artist since, I don't know, since I graduated from college, I guess, in 2006. Okay. So I've been in some way connected to art one way or the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you're here in Madison. I'm living in Middleton. Um, oh, okay. Practicing in Madison. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or Dane County area. Um, I, my recent work has been mostly community focused art. Uh, so I invite others in my art process and make work with other people. Mm -hmm. um, I am a paper maker. And so that's my, my, my favorite medium is paper, handmade yeah. paper, uh, fiber artist. So I do other work with textiles and thread and embroidery is what I've been doing lately. Um, but I, I'm also a teacher. I'm an art educator K through eight right now. Mm -hmm. And, um, mother of two beautiful children and, <laughs> yeah. um, and yeah, I, I, my, my time is split doing many, many things. So I think that's the life of many artists. How long we, have you been an art teacher? I started about four years ago. Okay. And that's mm -hmm. in Middleton as well? No, that's at Lighthouse Christian School. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. And working with children, is that when you, so when you wanted to be an art teacher, were you planning to be a grade school art teacher or were you wanting to do were you wanting to be an art teacher at all? How did that come about? I never thought of myself even being an artist or a teacher or anything like that. Um, I went to, I started college um, with the intention of doing architecture. Um, and then life events started to happen, which made me want to switch that. And eventually from architecture, I switched to graphic design. And from graphic design, I switched to art general art. Um, but it wasn't something that I had been planning all my life. Um, I loved the creative process all my life. But uh, because I'm from Honduras, art is just something you don't think of as a career ever. Yeah, people um, say that a lot. It's it, mm -hmm. like people tell them you shouldn't go to school for art or there's no money in it. I mean, there's yeah, there isn't it's difficult, but it, there is ways to go around it but yeah so you started out with architecture but then why yeah. did you switch why did you switch to graphic design <laughs> well the reason I started with architecture is because I was really good at math in high school and my my math teacher when she asked me what I wanted to study and I said graphic design she said mm, you're better than that <laughs> So I was like, oh, <laughs> so, I guess not the reaction you want, of course. Yeah, no, all right. she's, and, and she put planted the seed of like, why don't you study something that blends math 
and art, like architecture. She planted the seed and I was like, hmm, I hadn't thought of architecture. And the more right. I thought about it, I liked it. Um, and so I decided that I would go that route because it felt more of a professional career that people would support and stand behind. Um, people like my family. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so um, in a way, it almost would feel embarrassing to study art or graphic design. Um, because here I am getting an opportunity of a lifetime for from being from Honduras, which is very hard for someone from Honduras to come to the United States and get a an education in the United States. It's a few of us that get that opportunity. And I get the opportunity. And it, it was almost like I was throwing away that opportunity by saying, I'm gonna do art, <laughs> you right. know? Yeah. So it felt like usually if you get the opportunity to, to go and study abroad and you get scholarships and you get the support that you need, you wanna do something that matters and something mm -hmm. that gives back to the community some way or another. So, so for me, architecture, I could say, oh, I can give back to the community right. architecture. Well, and that um, depends on what you do with the architecture as well, because- Exactly. Yeah, it, it, I so, mean, if you're doing it for the community, yes, but also mm -hmm. if you're making a living at it, people are hiring you to create something for them. You know, so yes. it, it's hard to say, yeah. Yep, so I started in that with that idea in mind, um, when I went back to my home, to Honduras for winter break, my after my first semester, my mom had a car accident, a very serious car accident, and it left her quadriplegic. So I decided to not go back to school and to stay and take care of her for that second semester. And that second semester taking care of her and just kind of my life turning upside down, I decided that I did a lot of thinking. And my my parents at the time said, you know what, while you're here, keep going, uh, let's enroll you in school here in really? Honduras and okay. and just keep studying something. What do you want to study? And, and, I, and I was like, I don't know if I want to do architecture. I want to do something that, during this time I was going through so much with my mom that I was like, I just need a creative release in some way or another. So I'm going to go back into graphic design because I just want to feel creative in that way um, with visual communication. And so there was this arts and architecture school in, in Tegucigalpa, which is where I'm from, and called SEDAC. And I decided to, for that semester, to enroll in there and do graphic design. Um, okay. And so that, I got really, I really liked it. Like that, um, just that very, it was like three months, three or four months and I loved it. So then I I had already established all these relationships in the United States because of my first semester there. And so they, the, that the university, they were writing to me and saying, come back. We're going to support you financially. Just come back. Really? And they gave me a really good financial package that I couldn't refuse. Oh, wow. And so I, um, I didn't have to pay much. And so, and it was great because my mom could no longer work and help me anymore, uh, pay for college. And so when they knew about my story, they, they created a, a financial package that was really wonderful. And so I went back to Judson University in Elgin, Illinois, um, and went back as a graphic design student because okay. I liked it so much. What kind but, of graphic design stuff were you doing? Um, I mean, you, in school? Yeah. Yeah, like Just, you, you had switched from architecture to graphic design. They are very yeah. different things. So yeah. what would be so, the style that you did? It's not necessarily like the style was more about the classes. So I instead of taking these okay. certain classes, I was taking these classes on typography and digital tools. And at that time, you know, we were using, um, we still had, discs right yeah <laughs> the zip drives uh, yes the zip drives <laughs> um 
and our digital tools look very different from now. Like we were learning Illustrator, you know, and and the Adobe programs, but it was a very different. Oh, you weren't on way. like Corel or Quark or whatever. I those other did ones? learn Corel okay. in Honduras. <laughs> okay, I liked Corel. I actually yeah. preferred that one. Yeah, and then I came here and I got um, you know, it was started to study all the Adobe suite, yeah. all of those programs, but um so the money kept running out like i even though i had a great financial package there was still a portion that i had to pay and there was a uh, things kept happening in my life uh, my dad got diagnosed with cancer and he said no i can't support you anymore so first it was my mom and my dad helping me then my mom kind of fell out of the picture but my dad was still helping me with that little portion that the that i still had to pay but then my dad fell out of the picture because he got sick and so then I was on my own. Um, and because I'm an international student, I, I can't apply for loans. So for that small portion, I had to figure it out. And um, the way I turned it around was that I switched to art because okay. the reason I switched to art is because within that major, there were more room for electives. And okay. so with graphic design, there was not many electives you could take. You had to take all of these courses. Hmm. With art, you had to take these courses, but there was like this list of just electives. And one of the electives was language, a language elective. Okay. And I was I was fluent in Spanish. So what I did is I took a CLEP in Spanish that gave me 12 credit hours. I just took a two hour test and I hmm. got 12 credit hours. So I got my semester back that I lost when I went, when I stayed in Honduras. Oh, wow. So the okay. only way I could make that work is by changing my major to art so that the, that elective could apply. So instead of doing a graphic design show for my senior and focusing on graphic design, yeah, I had to focus on art, fine art, and do an art exhibition. Okay. And so it changed my entire way of thinking, right? Because then I wasn't thinking about functional product design or graphic design solving a problem. I was thinking of finding my voice, expressing myself, <laughs> through this work of uh, this exhibition. And so I had to switch gears my last year as a senior yeah. and I loved it. Again, I, all of these kept, things kept happening, but I was so happy with the result. And I ended up um, doing a lot of abstract work, um, relief kind of sculpture yeah. um, work. And um, that's where my kind of my fine art journey kind of put it, had a stop. Mm -hmm. And then I was my, there was this person that came to my show who loved everything that I did and loved the fact that I spoke Spanish and he hired me to oh. work for his company, not doing art, Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but even though he loved my work, he hired me to train me to manage a production company in Nicaragua. So he made tons of beaded products that were sold in the thousands and thousands across the United States. Yeah. And they were getting made in Nicaragua by like a hundred women in Nicaragua. And he needed someone who spoke Spanish, who had an eye for art and design and had also could be trained in management, which uh -huh. I don't know where he got that from that I right. could be trained in that. But, <laughs> yeah. but he believed in me and I worked there for like four years and I got trained in production management and I loved it too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I loved, it was like a bittersweet relationship with that because it was right in the middle of the recession 2008 time. And our big, we, we would call it our big whale was borders. Um, the bookstore? That, that, that bookstore was the one that bought the product in thousands and thousands. So, and so beaded that, products to a yeah, bookstore. Yeah, they were bookmarks. They were beaded, beaded oh, bookmarks. Oh, that makes more sense. They had, okay. They had beaded bookmarks, beaded pens, beaded um, like keychains, be different kinds of beaded things that they sold at, at the bookstores, like right when you're checking out, you know? Yeah. Is it weird that this sounds like a plot line in like the show Arrested Development or something where somehow <laughs> they were able to sell like all, just beaded products to a big chain? Yes. <laughs> yes. And he started like, that's how that company started. He literally went to each store 
show them the product, say, are you interested? Wow. And he went, when he landed Borders, it became a million dollar company, you know, because it was such a yeah. huge company. We, that's why we call it the big whale. Uh -huh. So, and it supported all these women in Nicaragua for like 10 years. And then the recession hit mm -hmm. and Borders went bankrupt. And so when Borders went bankrupt, took us under, took a lot of companies under that supplied them. And so um, it took the manufacturing company um, under um, in Nicaragua, we had to shut it down. So it was bittersweet because that was really hard. I had established a really good relationship with these women. Mm -hmm. And I would go every two or three months and visit them and train them and supervise them. Um, and many of them were single moms living in poverty. And all they had was this job. And and letting them go is one of the hardest thing I've ever done. Yeah, I can um, imagine. in my life, it was heartbreaking. And in, in fact, I still have letters from them oh. begging us not to let them go. Yeah. Um. So that was really sad, but that experience built this passion in me for work for working with women, and for working with craft, because I believe that 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 like that beaded production was is a craft. Like that, and so, um, I really like the idea of using art and craft as a tool for empowerment, economic empowerment, and I became really interested in that. And I started to search for for companies that did that, and um, and that's where I found out about fair trade and that whole area and what that is and what and the companies and organizations that do for that practice fair trade. Um, and I heard about serve international, which is based in Madison. Yeah. And so, yeah. And, and they had a store at first, their store was in Monroe street. Um, and so I decided I, when I was, um, when we shut down book thongs is what it was the name of the beaded company. Um, my husband and I decided to move to Madison and kind of start over here. Oh, you moved here we, because of serve. We moved here because we wanted it. To, it was right at, you know, in the middle of the recession and we needed, we wanted a reset. Um, my okay. husband was working remotely so he could work from everywhere. I needed a break from the, the, all the letting go. And that was really hard. Um, yeah. And so I was like, let's, this time is a good time to kind of start somewhere over and look for, for me to look for a new job and stuff. And I want to do it in Madison. I don't want to do it in Chicago land. Um, I want to be close to family and my fam. I had my brother in Madison. My mom had just moved to Madison. I wanted to be close to family. And we were thinking about starting a family ourselves. And I wanted to do that in a in Madison, because I always thought Madison was like the perfect place to have a family. Had you heard about Madison before? I, I so I had lived in Madison for four years when I was little, from when I was 10 years old to when I was 14. Mm. Um, in fact, that's a little interesting little chapter of my life, because that's when I first took my first art class ever in my life, <laughs> was in fourth grade. Really? Where at? At, at Van Heys um okay elementary <laughs> um i had never in honduras we don't have art classes what? we don't have live we don't have libraries we don't have art classes we don't hmm. all of these wonderful resources that are available here we don't have there and so for me to have a an art class was like oh my goodness you yeah. can do this as a class yeah and so it was, for me um i think that's the first time that I actually realized that how amazing art was, but um, yeah. And so I lived here for four years because my dad was going to UW to get his PhD. Okay. And gotcha. So, mm -hmm, when he was done, we went back and I finished my high. Well, were you here like during the summer or during a winter? <laughs> oh, we were here the four years. So we oh, the four years. The That's seasons. right. You did say four years. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We experienced all of the seasons. And then when we went back to Honduras, I was there until 11th grade. And then I just, because my dream had been the United States all my life to study mm -hmm. here, I decided to come for my senior year of high school and complete it here. Oh. Um, 
so that I, it could be easier for me to enter colleges. Yeah. Um, and so I did my senior year of high school in Amory, Mississippi. Okay. I have no idea a where very, that is. <laughs> it's like a whole different world. Yeah. <laughs> so different there. Very, very different world um, from Madison. Yeah. So. I've um, been down there, but uh, I mean, clearly not. I just said I have no idea where the place you said was, but I've been down to Mississippi and stuff. Yeah, it is very different, especially... Well, I guess I don't get out much, so I have nothing to compare it to. I don't know. Everything's different to me. <laughs> well, their way of thinking and just there, there's it's just a complete different culture almost. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, even the accent, I had a hard time understanding my teachers. Really? Because of their strong Southern accent. I, w I was okay. always like w wondering what they were saying. but And our big um, nasally... But accent is okay our big nasally wisconsin accent. i can understand wisconsin <laughs> okay <laughs> that from? Yeah. for me the biggest shock i thought it was just a movie thing this is what i had seen in movies mm -hmm. in honduras but my biggest shock was the racism oh okay um, it was really racist uh i had never seen that hmm. and in honduras we don't have a, a divide be of color skin color we have a divide of um, economic status, poor and rich, we have a huge divide, but we we are not necessarily discriminatory based on on skin color. Okay. And so I had I had never experienced that until I went to Mississippi, hmm. and where everything was segregated. I mean, like black, all of the black people sat in one side, the white people sat in the other. I mean, I literally went to a. My friends, the people I became friends were, were were foreign exchange students, and when I went to their orientation with them, they were told not to date African Americans. Hmm. That's how racist it was to the point of like, it's on you if you decide to make that choice. I, I thought it was like I was living in some movie in the nineteen, you know, fifties or something. It was crazy. I right. I didn't realize. But that was still very much present there. At this point, of course, you had finished school when you started working for this company, right? The company that had... Oh, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. And now from that point, had you done anything with... Uh, you had said you'd done graphic design, you were doing architecture, and then you moved into art, and you explained the reason behind that. Now, what I want to know is, because of the stuff that you make, the projects that you do... Had you been working, aside from the beaded company, working with uh, different mediums? Because at this point, all I've understood it as is it's really just drawing and math. And now a lot of what you do is very much, I want to say, tactile, texture. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. So, so is that what put you in that direction? Like, I'd really like to know how you started working with the mediums that you do. And then I have to ask, I'm okay. going to ask about the paper later, but so what happened after yeah, studying at Judson, art? At Judson, I just experimented with drawing and painting and that's it. Um, okay. My work, again, was more of a relief sculpture type of work where um, I was exploring form with paper. Um, and so kind of bringing it out from the surface and bending it and creating like a relief sculpture with pa painted paper um, or like like illustration board kind of thickness. Um, that's what I kind of worked for my senior show. But um, and why? And what, then I, what, what was it, like how I that's the thing I've tried like. <laughs> I did paper mache like once. Now yeah. me, my biggest problem is um, I, I like the way it looks. I think a lot of the textured stuff is great. But when I work with it, it makes my teeth hurt. Like it, it, touching especially wet paper, wet, even just yeah. talking about it right now is making my yeah. teeth hurt. So, And that's my problem. Yeah. That's just like something, something weird in my head that mm -hmm. <laughs> doesn't accept it. Um, and that's just yeah. because of the feel. But like what... What made you think to work in that medium? I'm sorry that I just went off on a whole That's, thing. About you know, my um, when my mom had the car accident, I spent a lot of time on my sketchbook doodling, just doodling. It was kind of like a re uh, creative 
therapy for me to just not have to draw realistic things. Um, so I, I just use line and color and let my mind wander and let my hand lead me to in different ways and just kind of express myself through that. Um, and I filled sketchbooks just with doodles. And the doodles started to kind of create abstract images. Um, and it was really interesting because the images were kind of being informed by what was going around on in my life at the time. Mm -hmm. And so the color that I was using, the patterns that I was using, the lines that I was using were very, for me, very much um, reflecting my inner world at the time. And I took all of that sketchbook when I went back to Judson after the accident I, I looked at all of those sketchbooks and I decided that I was my senior show was going to be based on those doodles. Mm -hmm. And so what I decided to do was I decided to kind of lift those doodles off of the paper oh. and, cr and create forms of them going in and out, in and out. Okay. But, and it was no longer a 2D drawing. It was starting to emerge as a 3D drawing. And so the whole show was based on these doodles. All right. Um, Okay. Yeah, which was informed by what happened to me with my mother. And so I, I, it's a lot of the work I did at Judson in my projects for classes and stuff was all being informed and for about the accident and me processing the fact that my mom could not walk ever again. Yeah. Like she was a completely, she couldn't move neck down. And that was very hard for me. It was very hard. And so for me, I used art as a way to process all of that because I couldn't talk about it. I didn't know how to, I don't know, like move through that experience and, yeah. and art was my medium and it, and it was through doodles, okay. <laughs> through, yeah. uh, through color and line and pattern. Um, and I think, uh, I became in love with the idea of not having to create work that looked like a specific image. I love the idea of just using formal elements okay. to make work. And I became very interested in abstract expressionist artists at the time, Jackson Pollock, Helen Frankenthaler. Um, I was looking at uh, Rothko, like all of artists who were just using color to, to make work, um, color field painting. Um, and so when I took the job, with book thongs, all of that creative energy kind of stopped mm -hmm. and be, I became very focused on business. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> I get it. Um, and so, that, but it allowed me to, to form relationships with these women. And, mm -hmm. and then I started thinking a lot, like I said before, about how art and craft could be used as a tool for economic empowerment, specifically yeah. with women. And when I started looking at serve and then I, I volunteered at the store and okay. then a job was uh, opening was available in product development. Oh, okay. and so I, I applied and I got it and I, I um, worked in product development at serve for another four years and I loved my job there. Um, again, it was like a mixture of creativity and it, administration, very administrative job and very creative and also creative, but mostly administrative. Mm -hmm. um, my favorite part was when they would send me to different countries in Latin America to train. Oh, yeah. You know, <laughs> uh, other producer groups or artisans or artists or whatever they chose to call themselves um, in how to make a product that would sell in North America. Um, right. And just traveling, I traveled, you know, through Central America, Mexico, through South America, and that was amazing. I loved that. Um, and when we started working on importing garments from mm -hmm. India, um, we started looking at like requirements in order for those garments to get through customs. And there was like flammability requirements, color testing requirements, things like that. Color um, testing requirements. Like so that they're color fast. It wasn't okay. um, necessarily a requirement by customs, but it was a requirement by 
us. Oh, okay. All right. So I, that, I was just like, why would color keep it from getting yeah, into the country? Flammability, they, okay, yeah, gotcha. for sure. Like, but color testing was important for us gotcha. so that when a customer washed it, it would. Okay, that makes more sense. But, and, and, uh, I thought you were saying because I did hear flammability, and then you said yes, color, and I was yes. like. Yeah. I, I, how would you even test for that in customs? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so my coworker and I, who were in product development, we heard about a certificate program at UW um, uh, called uh, textile science and where you would study flammability requirements. You would study the properties of fibers and like get really technical into uh, you know, textiles and how the, the, we studied the color spectral photometer. I, I, I'm totally not saying that right. <laughs> That's all right. But basically what tests color. And you could have said so anything anyways, and I would have believed you. <laughs> it's a very, very complicated word. Okay. Um, uh, so we, we got the certificate. We were there for like a year like a couple semesters, two or three semesters, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where I heard about the textile design program mm, at okay. UW that kind of, yeah. So it was School kind of, of Human... a unique alignment. All right, yeah. Yes, it was through the School of Human Ecology. And I started talking to Jenny Angus and Carolyn Callenborn, who is no longer working there. Um, so I talked to both of them about the program and I was re I became really interested in it. Um, and I, I applied for their MFA. Um, and I qualified for a great grad assistantship. So I, I, I was paid for. And so I was, I decided to stop working for serve and I went back to school and, um, and my idea at the, at the beginning was to continue to focus on product design. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and that was quickly shut down the first semester. Um, okay. I was there in the program, uh, by my professors and with, with a good reason. Um, I was still focusing on the idea of helping others mm. through design and through art. And they were like, this is a time for you to be selfish. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. This, these three years is a time for you to focus on yourself and to, for you to focus on your own artistic voice and find that what it is and strengthen it. And then when you are done with that, then you can go back and, and help others. And that made so much sense to me because, mm -hmm. um, my artistic voice had, or the journey of my, my artistic journey in finding my own voice as an artist had kind of stopped when I graduated with my BA. Mm -hmm. um, because then I started working in all these administrative jobs. And so this was a time to get back into my creative mode. Yeah. And so I did that. I took a break from design and I went straight into art um, and started experimenting with different techniques textile techniques seeing which one i you know responded to the most and paper making was the one that i fell in love with uh, paper making is such a forgiving medium um it it is a medium with so many possibilities mm -hmm. for experimentation and there's not a need for me to follow a, a rule or a restriction um, I feel like screen paint printing, for example, for me feels very limited in, in that I have to be very precise mm -hmm. with how I transfer things, right? Mm -hmm. um, how I create an image, how I transfer that image, how I press that image, like everything. You have to be such so good with craftsmanship. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And screen printing. Yeah. And also even making the screen itself is yeah, yeah, everything. perfect at every that. Every part. I right? always like, screw up the whole burning the screen thing. Yeah, I either I leave it on too every long or, Every yeah. step of the process, I screw it up and I feel so upset because I'm a perfectionist. <laughs> and so when I don't get, if I get a little dot somewhere, I'm just like, I'm starting over, you know, <laughs> and that gets in my way of, of my creative, in the, it gets in my way. Well, and so, it, yeah, I, well, that goes to when you are talking about the paper, the paper is actually imperfect. And as a matter of fact, it can turn out to be 
whatever it feels like being, you know? <laughs> exactly. It's like, I can't control it yeah. at all. I can control aspects of it, but there's this element of surprise to the paper making process where you just got to let it go and just let it be and let mm -hmm. it do its thing. And I love that. <laughs> right. Yeah. I absolutely love that, that, that there's a part of it that I don't have control of and I don't have to be so, you know, I don't know, perfectionist about, um, like if, if even like pulp painting, right? Like if, if I do a pulp and I want to make an image with pulp painting, it doesn't do it the mm -hmm. way I want it to, mm -hmm. but it does something that I'm more interested in. Yeah. It creates a more interesting image than what I would have created if I would have premeditated and drawn that image in a sketchbook and then wanted to exactly replicate that with a pole painting. I love that pole painting does its own thing and it goes, you know, it creates a very abstract image. And I'm just like so drawn to that mm -hmm. much more than if it would have created something that I had full control over. Yeah. And so okay. <laughs> that's what I yeah. love. I love about paper making, you know, I, the last piece I just completed is actually a self, uh, an embroidered self portrait, very realistic. It, you know, it's from a photo, it, everything is filled in perfectly and every stitch. And I had such a hard time with that. It's the piece that I've had the hardest time because I'm like, this is not me. Mm. Like, this is not my style. This is not how I work, but I did it because it was a group project, right? Every, like there was like several of us working on the same thing. They were doing their own portraits. I was doing mine. And and right now it's actually, the exhibition is at this Friday um, at Goodman South Library. But that process was so hard for me. And mm -hmm. <laughs> my process is more like, I don't know if I have a little example here. Um, where I was embroidering paper and I was just, I wasn't doing a traditional embroidery stitch. I was yeah. just going crazy with it and pulling some of the threads and making some texture with the thread. That is my process, right? It's more, mm -hmm. ex uh, I like, it, I feel like I'm playing with it. It's more exploratory. So um, I did a whole collection of them with different kinds of embroidery stitches that went crazy, okay. kind of like totally non-traditional stitches. Yeah. <laughs> That and that is how I like to work, you mm -hmm. know. And um, if I were to do this self portrait project again, it, it would probably be all full of those kinds of stitches instead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you wouldn't be able to tell that it's my face, but um, I don't know. It, it, it would that process would definitely be more interesting for me. Well, <laughs> and that's the thing too is when you talk about creating paper and stuff like that, it really is more like it's not. It's not like you're creating pages for people to use as paper or like just sheets of paper. You're no. creating quilts from layered pulp and different yeah. colors and textures yeah. in the paper. Yes. And that's, yeah, it's not just paper. Because there are, there is paper out there like that. There's paper you can buy right. sheets of that are oh, flat absolutely. and different colors and have things inside of it. Yes. But you are, like you just said, you're embroidering them and yeah. sewing them together. A yeah. Yes, I'm I'm going crazy with them. You know, like if my if my I know a lot of my pieces, my four year old at the times was part of the process. Like he would come and do something to it and I would be totally fine, you know, <laughs> because I'm like, you know what, I'm gonna rip that apart anyways right, later. Yeah. So it's okay. <laughs> yeah. So so it feels really good when I do community art projects with paper because kids come adults come and they can do whatever they want and i'm totally fine with it and i will work with whatever mark they make mm -hmm. um for me it's it's a it's a way of collecting marks when i do pulp painting with the community and their mark is valid and beautiful and i will make it work into something um and that's that's one of my favorite pieces that i've made is the one that i made for penny library um with the community it's like a five foot by five foot piece and it's uh i was the penny artist in residence and i for a whole summer i invited people to come and make paper with me mm -hmm. uh kid like all ages 
and they all and they have a nice little video that they not little video they have a nice video that they made about it it's yes very well done yeah yeah and i loved it i loved that whole process because it gave me the opportunity to be with the community for an amount of time Mm -hmm. then to be with a smaller community of women to just embroider and then it gave me and also gave me the opportunity to just be by myself and work mm-hmm. with it by myself. And so, and that is, I think my favorite art process and, and where I get to be involved with people in some way or another, but then I bring it back and I'm on my own and I get to, you know, just um, adjust and modify it to however I want it to yeah. be modified. Um, I wouldn't say, that I, it's a collaborative process. I would say it's more of a participatory where hmm. people are not necessarily involved in the idea and, and the final, Okay. how I'm gonna do it, like end up what the final result will be, but they are definitely involved in making some sort of mark in it. Well, and a lot of people um, going into it aren't aware what it is they are supposed to do or it mm-hmm. actually takes off some of the pressure because you're going yeah. well here's what you do and what are you feeling right, right now go ahead and do it because that's yes. what part of this process is rather exactly. than going you know you would have to sit them down and give them an orientation and go here's yes. how this piece works yes <laughs> yeah see that's what i have to d- <laughs> it's interesting because an, as an art educator i go back and forth between how much choice I allow the student to have in their own art making, right? It, teachers, art teachers can be, can their method can be very directed where they're directing every single step and everybody's creating the exact same sunset, right? Mm-hmm. But the teacher's telling them, you put this color here, you put this color here, mm-hmm. you put this color. Mm-hmm. And there's, they're obviously making the piece, but there's not much creative choice in that, right? Like they're not getting to choose where to put things, how to do it. Right. And then teachers also have the opportunity to do more choice where you're like, you can create any kind of landscape. These are some techniques. Go ahead, go do it. Yeah. And of course, depending (laughs) on the age, because if it's middle school kids, you're just going to get a bunch of inappropriate jokes. Yes. Um. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So with my band logos or whatever the kids are drawing today. Yes. (laughs) With my community art process, I prefer um, that they come and paint however they want to paint and make the paper however they want to make it. And then I, you know, like I said, I, I'll figure out what to do with that mm-hmm. um, versus like me making a mural and telling them you have to paint this specific area red and it has to be inside of these black lines. <laughs> Okay. You know, yeah. that would be too too stressful for me right. to control. Have you done then I was, I've done like three. Okay. Um, All right. I didn't know back that. Back when I was like just graduated from college, oh, I had okay. the opportunity to do like three murals for the city in Elgin. Okay. Um, but I've never done murals like where I'm the lead artist and I'm allowing others to come and help. Okay. Uh, I don't think I could do it. I think it would be too stressful for me. I, I feel the same. I did. I remember yeah. I did a mural in high school and thinking back on it, I have no idea how it got done. I, I literally <laughs> don't remember a thing about it. I just remember the finished product. And I'm like, I don't remember working on this at all. <laughs> like, when did I do this? Oh, my goodness. Because <laughs> if I got a free yes. period, I was going to leave. Uh, yes. You know, they... I don't know. So I, I was thinking yeah. about that the other day because I was thinking about murals. And I've, I know a lot of people who do murals. And that actually, ha- yeah. that is a re-emerging form. And a lot of people do get those nowadays or want those. Mm-hmm. And so it's an interesting it's an interesting thing to see how many artists are doing that these days. But one thing I did want to ask about, though, is you have like several concurrent gallery shows happening for periods of time over this oh, entire summer tell me about those and what's going on with those you have you have a bunch of different ones one that's currently going on right now another that's going to be starting and or did start i'm so, so confused starts, you have so many so, <laughs> no there's just a few um, okay so there's there's a show in milwaukee um right now uh that goes through march 
it's like it's a textile based show um, at the Center for Visual Arts, CVA, I think it's called. Okay. Um, and that one, yeah, ends in March, and it, and where several fiber artists are, you know, have their work there. Um, and then I, right now, I just actually last weekend I installed, uh, like eleven self self embroidered portraits. Yeah. of 11 Latina immigrants. And this is all a result of a project called Bordando Memorias or Embroidering Memories. Um, and this was the last thing that I'm still working on it. Um, this is this is a project that I did out of a residency at Synergy Coworking. So um, I got a grant to kind of form the this group of uh, of women and come together and learn how to embroider and then do a project together. Um, and so this is kind of the culmination of that um, residency. Um, although I'm also doing these four tables um, mm -hmm. that are kind of being informed by this project. And these tables are more work that I'm leading, that I'm doing on my own. Um, where, and then after I design and put them together, I will invite others to come and help me embroider. Mm -hmm. um, and this will happen in the libraries. So these tables are for the libraries. Um, and I'm hoping to finish them this summer so that programming, programming around them happens in the fall. Okay. Um, what programming? Uh, where people come and sit down and we have a Latina immigrant and we have anybody else coming, sitting down, listening oh. to the Latina immigrant, share her story while we embroider together oh. this image on the table. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So it's kind of using embroidery as a way to slow down. Yeah. Embroidery forces you to slow down, right? Like stitch by stitch, you have to slow down. Mm -hmm. So when you slow down through craft, you have a, you now have the ability to solo down to listen and to just really listen. And that's what I am interested in somebody coming and sitting with a Latina immigrant and listening mm -hmm. to her story and what she, and, and finding and the sharing of stories between that person that sits down and the Latina immigrant sharing with each other stories that create some kind of bonding experience between them yeah. and creates in a way community. Um, so that's kind of the idea behind those tables is like embroidery as a medium for creating community hmm. um, and kind of um, a way of destroying this bubble that we all live in. Um, when I did a project called with another artist called Sonia Una Milpa, um, we sat down and listened to Latina immigrants tell us their stories of immigration. Mm -hmm. And one continuous thing that I heard them say was that they didn't know how to break that bubble. They didn't know how to connect with other people here in hmm. America, in the United States, because okay. there was a language barrier. Yeah. Um, they, were, they didn't know what to talk about. They, they didn't know how to connect. And so after I heard that, that has always been in the back of my mind, like, how can we use art to help us connect with one another? And um, and so that's kind of like what I'm thinking about when I'm making these tables. How can we use embroidery as a way to help us connect and listen to one another and um, slow down? Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, I'm I'm working on those. Those are involving dye techniques. That's why it's taking forever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, experimenting with those two, so I'm like dyeing this fabric, with, and it's all in natural dyes. So natural dye. I saw that you posted forever. something about that. You were something about a bug that you couldn't find yes. or had. Yes, oh. I uh, Blah, used first of all cochineal. <laughs> yeah, I used cochineal, which is a bug in what, that you can find in the cactus, um, and when you grind it, okay. it's when it's dry and you grind it. It creates this blood red color. Yeah, I would imagine. We're dying. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I'm using all of these like dyes that you can find in Latin America. Okay. 
And so I, I'm very intentional about the materials that I use. Um, and so for me, because this whole project, Bordando Memorias, was inspired by native flowers from Wisconsin hmm. and our countries. And it was all about flowers and what does it feel to be native? What does it feel to be invasive? What does it feel to uh, be transplanted from one culture to the other? How do we survive in this new soil? You know, like it was all these kind of like symbolism. I felt like I couldn't use chemical dyes for my project. Right. Yeah. Um, I had to use natural dyes and okay. especially Valid. natural dyes that have a history to them, a Latin American link to them mm -hmm. somewhere or another. So, but that means it just takes a long time for me to do it um, because again, just the preparation of the fabric to be able to, you know, get the dye and just, the I dye it, but then I don't like it, and so then I have to right. re dye it, and then so it's just it takes it takes a while, and I and I there's need... that weird juxtaposition of perfect and imperfect that you were talking yes. about before. Yes, <laughs> yes, and and dye, I feel like it's harder. It's a, a longer process than yeah. paper making, for example. Paper, I don't know, feels faster to me, hmm. and so I can, but dyeing feels longer to me, and so I just feel like it just it's such a I'm going turtles. Okay. Space All right. In this project. Um, also, I just, I have so many things going on right now that I need just a chunk of time just to focus on this, these tables, you well, know, and I haven't had that. And yeah. so this summer I'm going to dedicate myself to the table. <laughs> but that's what I was saying. I was like, you have all these ex exhibits and things going on and you're like, well, I only have a few. I'm sorry. That <laughs> sounds like a lot. And then you just said you have so many things going on. So yeah, there you go. Yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's so hard right now. Yeah. Uh, I'm doing student teaching. So I, even though I teach part-time at Lighthouse, I decided to get my teaching license. Oh. I, I didn't have my teaching license. Okay. Um, and Lighthouse is a private school, so I can teach there without a license, but right. I had never been taught how to teach art. And I hmm. felt like I was missing out on a lot by not knowing that. And so even though Lighthouse provided a lot of coaching and training, which helped me a lot uh, to know how to teach, mm -hmm. I feel like I still needed to go back to school and, and learn more about art methods and better ways of teaching art. And so I did. I, I, I'm graduating with the certificate this uh, June. Oh, wow. And so, right, nice. so right now, right now I'm doing my student teaching. I, I'm teaching at Lighthouse. And on the days I'm not teaching at Lighthouse, I'm teaching at Anana Elementary School. And then in a month, I'm going to go to Memorial High School, <laughs> teach there, and then I'll be done. I love it. You're so. like, you know what? I have five minutes that I'm not doing something this month. I should yes. really figure out a way to fill that up. <laughs> yes. Oh my goodness. Oh, so it's been really crazy. It's yeah. Really crazy. Well, that's awesome. I'm really happy for you. That's super cool. It's yeah. yeah. All right. Um, and then now I want to thank you for being with me here today. And uh, if people wanted to check out more of your work, where should they go do that? My website would be the best place. I think it's a good place to check out um, my community art projects, my artwork, my things I'm selling, yes. my teaching. I even added a teaching page to it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, so it has everything there in one place. That's Maria, M-A-R-I-A, Amalia, A-M-A-L-I-A dot com. All right. And then again, I want to thank you so much for talking with me. This has been great. Thank you, Tom. Thank you.